Uh, so my name is Mylise. I build interactive uh, ecologies using technology and nature um, to help people interact and interface with our natural world. Plant life for me has just been fascinating because it, it just is. <laughs> and partly when I was a kid and living in the countryside, um, I, w I was around it and, and just seeing it and being around it you know, taught me how magical it is. Um, and it was nothing more than that, really. It was itself that, that made itself obvious to me. And the music, um, uh, my parents had a recording studio when I was very young, um, so it might have been from there. Um, uh, but I, I, I just naturally loved music, and I just played music since I was a kid, so... Um, the two kind of were together and then later on in my life I realised that I could actually generate music electronically and use plants to, to do that and that was, that was a, whole, a whole thing because I wasn't really interested in computers or, um, yeah, I was kind of, I wasn't a Luddite but I wasn't like super into um, technology but when I figured that I could kind of bring like nature alive through it then I became very interested and I got fairly well versed in like coding and stuff like that um so yeah they came together because I I found out that they could more than anything so so formations actually um was the product of me learning super collider which I decided to use to um try to bring this musical aspect to plant life um, because it's code and so you can program it to to do whatever you want and that was why I got into it and through the process of learning it I um, I came up with formations and it was partly because a lot of the music that was being uh, made with computers was a lot of um, kind of uh, uh, um, modeling of acoustic things and I thought it would be interesting to model something that you could not make in nature, so a sound that had very few harmonics. Um, so formations in its uh, aesthetic um, um, sort of life is about um, exploring sounds that we could only ever make digitally. So kind of again, like using computers to do what you wouldn't be able to do naturally, um, but to explore some other dimensions that you know, we can only access really through technologies. I wrote formations like the piece for my BA thesis. So it was actually an eight channel uh, diffusion piece that um, I delivered as my, my, yeah, my thesis. So it was like a concert. And um, my friend Richard Thomas, who was at school with me, we, we did Sonic Arts at Middlesex together, said, oh, you should give this to these guys over at Low Recordings. and. They were like, oh, we'll release it. And I was like, okay, that's, that's amazing. And then I made a few more tracks um, to go on an album and released an album. And yeah, I was very surprised that anybody paid any attention to it because it was like algorithmic computer music. And that wasn't really a thing <laughs> at the time. <laughs> Ioracle is an interactive botanical sculpture that lets humans, plants and machines access the deep wisdom of nature and our ancestors. Ioracle interprets human and plant biosignals into the practical and magical insights of the ancient system of the I Ching, which you could say is the lingua franca of computer code. It's nature-guided ethics via immersive light and sound and element simulators that also work with um, sinology and text. So it, it basically a modernization of the I Ching um, using plants as an interface. And by doing so, it's, it's giving us the ability to have plants direct um, what may end up being an artificial intelligence with its data set as the I Ching and the questions we ask it. So it's synthesizing both our modern questions and what we are wondering about the world and ourselves and the kinds of uh, uh, guidance that we need now um, using the E-theory, which is the mathematical principles 
um, of the philosophy of the I Ching, which is an ethical system that's very ancient as the, 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 the base of information, so the data set. And the I Ching is actually a system that's based on ones and zeros, so it's a cosmology that's based on ones and zeros, which, as we know, is binary. So um, we can say that, um, in fact, the I Ching is the most ancient form of binary math and binary logic, and therefore the lingua franca of computing. And quite a good way, and this is what I like to look at with it, to teach machines ethics and also um, ethics that are derived from natural processes that are fundamental to the way the biosphere works um, and also what drives us as humans so um, it all kind of combines together and at the end you've got this um, reading like you would in the I Ching but um, delivered through a natural language processor and modern um, interpretations by the plant and by the machine um, as to what that ancient wisdom would mean today. So it, it's an opportunity to allow plants to interpret um, our biosignals and its own biosignals as a way to make element responses around it. So mists and water and wind and light um, change around it. So it, it may end up being able to start to understand that when it iterates certain biosignals, it will get certain responses. Um, so if it was, you know, a super successful experiment, plants would end up learning how to turn on the fan and um, turn on the water, um, change the lighting, and so on and so forth. Um, which are, you know, the elements of the I Ching. It's what makes up the um, parts of the hexagram. Um, and, and, and it would be kind of a, a way for it to learn that um, uh, at the same time as teaching um, a, a, comu a computer um, some of the principles of ethics and then also being able to communicate that to humans. Um, so it's kind of like this trifecta of um, generous um, abilities, so um, the ability for a plant to be able to perhaps control its own environment, a computer to learn um, how um, plants behave and the wisdom of uh, an ancient natural cosmology um, and a human ethics system and then humans being able to be um, guided by, by this ancient uh, wisdom. Um, and teach its computers something outside of our own very um, anthropocentric point of view, which has been a failure, um, we can pretty much say, both for the climate, um, for the rest of the living world, and for humanity itself. So modeling AIs on our data sets, um, just from our own inputs, is, um, you know, not necessarily a, um, a sound methodology to teach um, AIs um, uh, that, you know, we may be very much entwined with in the future, not only ourselves, but our, our living worlds. So, <laughs> so that's kind of what I'm trying to achieve. It's, a, it's not a science experiment, it's a thought experiment and an art project um, done as scientifically as possible and as rigorously as possible. But there are certainly constraints that if it were um, more of a science project, we would, we would look to change and control better. Um, but in a way, it's, it's just really important that we have the ability to even have access to anything like this, um, more than it is that it's specifically tuned to being extremely effective at doing that. Um, although it might be, who knows? <laughs> Pitt's Plant Parlour is a, a mobile biosanctuary um, designed really to bring nature to people in the, you know, um, very busy urban environment that we have and um, essentially serve to um, help people reconnect with 
nature in a way that allows them the kind of restorative effects um, that nature has on us. Um, but without having to stop what you're doing too much and go anywhere particularly, um, because those places are so rare and are very dense in the cities, um, it literally just brings it to you. And it also has all these elements of interactivity to, uh, to kind of um, elaborate on the interconnectivity that we have um, through um, lights and elements and sounds and sounds of nature, but also the generative sort of plant sounds that I like to make. Um, and, um, and, 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 you know, it's, it's, um, it, it's sort of a very democratic project where it, it, it's, not, it's not for museums or in a particular place where you have to pay or um, uh, somewhere where you, you just, you know, you have to uh, be privy to it to, to access it. It's literally on a street corner and you get out of the tube and you can go and sit in it. Um, and it's just a 15 minute respite from, um, from, from your daily um, urban life. It has more of a, a scope than just a sort of um, art project. It's also um, a way to demonstrate um, technology that people are really not very familiar with, um, which is a technology that we designed specifically to be driven by communities and um, derivative of natural processes using um, easy to make and easy to get materials uh, with a non-exclusive kind of attitude and philosophy so that uh, we can have clean energy made from our own waste, um, all types of waste anywhere on the planet without um, having to have you know, complicated degrees or a lot of money. So um, it's, 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 it's got a lot of scope in what it um, tries to achieve. Um, and, uh, and I think that overall, it's just a way to demonstrate what I like to call a culture of eco-citizenry. So a way to, to have infrastructure that is biophilic, so biophilic energy, biophilic technologies in biophilic systems and presented through um, um, modalities that uh, just give us beneficial wellness to our human selves through, through nature. So, so moon cells are, are not batteries, they generate power. So battery stores power, um, but moon cells generate power and they generate power from our waste. As humans, we're producing waste all the time. We're producing sewage waste. We're producing food, agricultural food waste. We're producing, you know, waste that we call garbage or trash or rubbish. Um, so municipal solid waste in technical terms. And um, all of these sources of waste are polluting our planet because we're dumping them into it. So we're taking resources out we're consuming them and then we're putting them back as pollution. And that means that we're using our biosphere as a place to extract materials and to, um, and to dump materials. And that's not what it's for. It's supposed to have a system that has um, interactions that compensate one another so that the energy and, um, and the outputs and inputs are all in a nice system. So that is the biosphere. That's why we have homeostasis, or we did, until we've now got climate chaos. But we had homeostasis, and that was one of the ways that worked. So inputs and outputs are balanced. And so really the moon cell is a mechanism by which we can do that using our waste as the energy that then we produce electricity with through the moon cell. And what it does is simply combine hydrogen and oxygen and create H2O, water, and electrons, which is electricity. And that's it. It's not very common to hear about using waste to power fuel cells. Um, and there's a few reasons for that. Um, fuel cells are uh, take different types of inputs. So some of them take methane, for example, as a direct input, and they do produce CO2. So um, these fuel cells are a little different than that. They're the ones that we use on the moon. So the Apollo mission used them. Um, and they're essentially a space technology, and they've been around for a very, very long time, in fact, since the 1800s. But um, uh, they are, they are um, pretty disruptive. Uh, so you could replace the entire oil industry 
uh, with fuel cells, um, and we could have always done that. Um, but the thing is, is that if people understand that actually, you know, we can use the resources around us that we um, typically throw away or pay to have removed, that really extracts a lot of money from industry that currently runs off of those profits. So there's a significant reason why um, this hasn't been invested in in the way that it should. Um, if we were behaving as citizens on this planet um, with a principle of taking care of ourselves and the planet. Um, uh, so it, it, it is pioneering work, um, but that shouldn't be the case. We run a, a, a center to help people learn how to make fuel cells, moon cells, um, and all the bits that go along with it, and also to help us um, make these things better so that we can share it and grow um, these technology systems to help people across the world. So uh, it's really important, and um, yeah, we're here to, to, to do that at the Center for Art and Renewable Energy. So looking at renewable energy systems, but also um, art and how to do both together. You can contact us. We are at care.earth. And then also um, we are beginning to create systems to help um, festivals and sort of um, art events be able to be powered through moon cells um, so that they're clean and quiet um, and green, actually green. So biophilic, I say, instead of just clean or green. Um, so if you're interested in, in being able to have one of these systems, use it or learn how to do it or teach people at your festival how to make it and then run your festival from it, so running the, the, the waste from your uh, toilets and the trash to then produce, uh, to run the fuel cells with and produce electricity from the waste, we'd love to develop that with you and help you do that. Um, so yeah, um, <laughs> contact us. Uh, at care.earth or um, on my art site which is biophilica.com And you're watching RRP TV